Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out um, to our evening of poetry. This is National Poetry Month. And so I thought, who better than to call Leah Graham from Marist and see if she would um, be willing to be our our poet in uh, the face of National Poetry Month and <laughs> asked her to get maybe together some of her students that might be interested in reading for us. So thank you so much for coming out and participating um, in celebrating the, the spoken word. So Leah Graham is the author of two poetry collections from the Hotel Vernon, Salmon Press, 2019, which she'll be reading from this evening, as well as Ho and Helix and Where and Here and You and You and You, um, No Tell Books, 2011, a fine press book called Murmurations by Hot Tomato Press, 2020, and three chat books, Spell to Spell, Above Ground Press, 2018, This End of the World, Notes to Robert Croach, uh, Apartment 9 Press, 2016, and Calendar Girls, again by Above Ground Press, 2006. She is the editor of the forthcoming anthology of critical essays, From the Word to the Place, the work of Michael Ania, Mad Hat Press, 2021. Her poems, reviews, articles, and translations have been published in numerous journals and anthologies. Uh, she is an associate professor of English at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York, and she does a lot for the Poughkeepsie community and especially for um, the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. So if you all join me in welcoming uh, Leah Graham. Thank you, Deborah. That's such a nice introduction. Um, it's always nice when you get an introduction and you think like, oh, I want to know that person. And then you're like, oh, they're describing me. Anyway, um, so we're, we're, what we're going to do tonight is um, we're going to start uh, with my student poets. Um, and I'll just, I'm going to introduce them one by one instead of as a group. But also, I'm just going to kind of talk just for a second about the kind of work that they've, oh, I'm going to take this off for now, yes, okay, ah, um, that they've been doing, um, particularly the, most of them in this poetry workshop have been writing poems called chentos. You may or may not know this, it doesn't matter, but a chento is a kind of, it's a, it means um, 100 in Italian, I believe, uh, but it's a collage poem. And it's a poem that's constructed out of lines from a lot of different other poems. Um, and then some of them will read uh, from these uh, poem, this crazy poem assignment, uh, map as metaphor. So it's a map of something, you know, a uh, map of bad relationships or map of, you know, my loneliness, whatever. So th things like that. And then, let's see, and then there's some odes. And you all know odes are like kind of a celebratory, uh, kind of a praise poem to something. So you're going to hear some of these things. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our first poet, um, and I'm going to embarrass her. Is it okay? Will you kill me? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So our first poet is Jessica Cordes, and Jessica is a graduating senior, um, a fine poet, and she just got into a, a master's program at the University of Alabama with a full ride. So welcome, Jessica Cordes. Hi, everybody. Hello. I'm going to take my mask off, too. Um, so I took a poetry workshop with Professor Graham two years ago, I think, um, and these are all poems that I wrote when I was in that class with her. The first one is called 10 p.m. Dylan's Bed. I am studying a world map on the wall of his dorm room, which is less about the map and more about anything that is not him right hand restless to his chest, one leg trapped below a navy blue blanket, the other burning for the door. The map is black, like soot or oil, clusters of bright lights in the world's biggest cities. Shanghai, Mumbai, my eyes fly to New York and I am somewhere amongst them. Warm light on the wall shines bright sunlight on the Eastern Hemisphere. 
His chewed fingers trace my skin. I wander. Half open dresser drawer, bodies in his mirrored closet door, a once white sock on linoleum floor. His hands move south to my pretty nice hips. I waver, he whispers, you're such a tease. Somewhere there is a beautiful woman boarding a plane taking flight to anywhere. She is unafraid. He asks me why I am so focused on the stupid map as if I have never seen one before. And without looking at him, I think I need to go home now. The next poem is called, I Can't Talk About My Body Today. Please don't make me, I'm tired, I understand. We are girls, born to dream we are anyone else, but Barbie doesn't breathe. Don't you see we are the weeds wishing to trees so big they brush the sky. And yes, I squeezed my face clean, squirted the spotted mirror last night, slept pus-stained, soaked pillow, woke up alive. Don't tell me about your belly, I am heavy. Healing is not a meeting, it is a full-time job. When the new boy told me he loved my body, I heard him loving some part of me, and I made it enough. I went out without makeup today, rubbed my eyes, raised my hand, flirted, crawled to sleep. You tell me we all want what we do not have, and for once, I agree. Peace. And the last poem I'll be reading is called Ode to White. My favorite color is untitled document, blank canvas, freshly fallen, not yet stepped in, no mud kissing the edges snow. First footprint, I claim a yard as my own, my boot like a flagpole planted in soil. Plows ruin everything. In 11th grade, I watched the girl's blood pond on vinyl tile after her face slammed against light blue lockers and bounced off. Jet black hair, sclera, red spreading, scarred security cameras, spilling Merlot on a white sweater is bound to leave a stain. Yours now to remember. Winter snow swallows my skin whole. My veins like tiny blue racer snakes. Bruno snorted at my wrists in sixth grade. He said I was so white, it's insane. Look at your veins. White jeans were the thing then, but Brooke bled through hers. Her private parts blossomed like a red carnation. As she shuffled to the nurse's office, chin trembling, I pledged myself to dark denim. I like granulated sugar, even more now that my mother says to take it easy. You can barely taste the coffee. Too often I am told to slow down. Scorched tongue on sweet danger. I'm afraid of dying young, but for you I've considered. Now my acne, stunning pink on bone white cheeks. After reconstructive surgery on both of my knees, I ignored the bottle of vitamin E. 10 pearlescent scars reflect morning sun. I go out without makeup. Write with blue ink, messy and unafraid. Erasing will not leave a page untouched. Thank you. And next uh, poet up is Ethan Maslin, Poughkeepsie's very own. Come on up. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> um, so my first poem here is uh, the cento that uh, Graham was talking about earlier, and it's called Azrael. And if you don't know, Azrael is the angel of death in biblical terms, and so it is winter. 
It's the hour of the blind and the dead. Bright bone white into cold blue-black space. Blotting out whatever came before. Distant angel, your wings are wide. Haven't they carried you everywhere up until now? You have what every poet hates in spite of all the solemn talk of contemplation. This is certain. You lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. Gray hair brushed back. Your bony fingers recalibrate the stations of the dead. You're tired. Whatever enlightenment there might be, it is easily forgotten. Who would believe you could be the answer to this? And then my second poem is The Map as a Metaphor, and this is called Thinking of the West. Through the window across the room, the mountains split the sky like a roadblock to heaven. Just outside the back door, there is a wide field of well-walked, sun-kissed grass. It scratches at the feet, but not unpleasantly. Moving further away from the door, the edge of the cliff this sleepy home sits atop draws near. Nothing but guardrails separating me from free falling into the dark, sparkling water below. I would join the fish at the bottom, all of them moving like people in Times Square, min mingling indiscriminately with each other, turning and leaning on the rails behind, looking once again to the beautiful stone walls basking in the day's last hurrah. There is an ethereal haze in the air, the one that occurs right before twilight, when the glow from the stalwart traffic lights is the brightest thing in view. Soon the moment has passed, and the chorus of the night begins. I look down to see my footprints in the grass, and I'm reminded of where I came from. Thank you. Our next poet, all the way from California, is Katie Nye. Hi, everybody. Um, so I will also be starting out with a chanta that I wrote. And it is entitled, From One Generation to Another. Think of me as the broken you, in an impossible task that almost no one would consider work. Procedure, setup, schedule. With wild mushroom risotto and a glass of Malbec in my skin has betrayed me. Oh, listener, I think of you alone there on Cliff's edge of your daily duties. You're tired, but everyone's tired. Blue embers blaze us, but the long road to the next life begins in this one. Reader, it is you that I think about now that you have arrived. Your dreams possible, pulsing, and right there. You think you know all the answers at that age. You can't wait to grow up and sort them out. It's the hour when everyone's drunk and the bar turns marvelous, music swirling over the red booths. We only know who we are in relation to something else. I'm haunted by how much our mothers do not know. What men in another age called revelation is blurring at the edges. Evolution is more than growth. It's a mix of conversation and revolution. You are the greatest catalyst for change and the greatest challenge to tradition. The moment you were born, the poem for the world wants to write you. And um, following this with my map as a metaphor, and this is entitled, <coughs> The Map I Followed. The north will always be filled with fog, but in that fog I see an intense light, like a light switch, except the light stays on regardless. And rather, some days it's enchanting, and on others it's blinding, but every day it's calling. The snow grows heavier with every push forward, but the awning in the distance is the goal, as told by the brightness that blazes and beckons. The west, the past, the fire, the ash, full of alarms that ring with no smoke cleared, friends and family I left here in the dust, memories that forged through flames, boiled a batch of bubbly naivety but burned a spark so bright that from the ash rose a phoenix. Below to the south, where shadows are cast, lay the footsteps that move through a doorway. 
Still is the frame, unlike my feet, that follow the directionary sign with clear commands but fuzzy instructions. And so the motion goes, following the road markings, that stretch on the floor begging for order, to a place where the lines blur the farther you go, and where the rain that finally falls slips silently into the sewers. The destination is the bus stop in the east, where potted plants are met with polluted air that locals find comforting and leave tourists troubled. The hot dog stand sits frozen, waves, and asks how my father is. Good, I reply, as I mention how I've heard all about their stories. The blizzard pounds down with a burn of a different kind. Though unfamiliar, it's welcoming, as I wonder why we left in the first place. And our last poet is Emma Shaw, all the way from Vermont. All right, welcome, Emma. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, so the first poem that I am going to be reading is, basically, I wrote a poem, and then I ran it through a word scrambler, and I pieced together a new poem from what was scrambled together. So this poem is called The Pressure. <clears throat> the pressure for you to know me seduces any waiting moment. With a murmur, I listen to the muted pattering of your fingertips across the keyboard. Your hands are outstretched and refusing to release me, spreading over my consciousness to itch corners of my mind. Nothing will address the cacophony of feelings I have once gained and now lost. Symphonies start and stop in my head. The band keeps playing until I collapse. Then my marching hand stops its unsteady trembling to grasp the sheet music of indecipherable notes. Release me. The calloused heart and the broken ribs are all infinite, taunting me across my view of the scattered whirlpools of your hair Mediocrity sits, telling me to feel how it thinks I should feel. Nothing moves forward but pressure. For like a word is a thousand hums, and a thousand words is a million earthquakes. To all that I succumb by feeling would further me like a forward judging chin. Only then to the infinite needles of your eyes pricking at my skin as my face grows crimson I will finally release that mediocrity to pressure, waiting to refuse words and address my song. So the next poem I'm going to be reading is also a map as a metaphor. And this one is called Map of Self-Inflicted Oblivion. <laughs> In the West, I can still see the footsteps left behind, bare prints in the snow leading to my driveway twisted together, fraying apart. My dirt-stained shoelaces haven't seen that path in years. But now I fill the road with orange peels. The doorstop is to the south, chipped and worn from the dormant beating of the rail and the sill. It was here before I was, so who am I to throw it away, even as it gives me splinters? Crystals and gemstones lined up in the east. The sun hits them and projects a kaleidoscope onto the bent pages of Marx and Sappho. How many post-its can I put on my walls to cover up the peeling paint? To the north, black masks are decor on my dresser, rearranged by the gust through the cracked open window. Strangers in the frames across the way don't wave. There's no reason to shovel snow as it falls. Could we give all these folks another big round of applause? I think that was so awesome. Yeah, thank you all. Ah, it's not good when you drop your books. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I think I'll, 
I'll start tonight by reading, um, starting off from my last full book of poems called um, From the Hotel Vernon. Here, here we go. And the Hotel Vernon, by the way, is uh, an actual place in Worcester, Massachusetts. It was a hotel that was built around the turn of the 20th century. And um, I lived, before I moved to New York um, and started teaching at Marist, I lived in Worcester for about seven years. And it was a place that it took me a long time to love, <laughs> right? Um, you know, not it's not in like Poughkeepsie, I think, in that post-industrial kind of beauty, right? Um, but this hotel, um, people had been telling me for a long time, you need to go to the Hotel Vernon. And I just somehow never quite made it there. And one spring, after I had got the job at Marist and I was getting ready to uh, leave uh, at the end of the summer, a friend called me and said, you got to come down to the Vernon. And I went down there, and it was marvelous in that there were these murals that had been painted in the 1940s. And in fact, that's partially... Um, you can kind of see it here on the cover. This, these are the uh, photograph um, of, of some of the murals or part of the murals. Um, and the murals are of the poem, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, all right? And so that kind of struck me. And then the other thing is that on one of the walls, um, the painter was Al Cap. Do you all know who Al Cap Does anybody know? I bet you know who Al Cap is. No? He was a cartoonist. Exactly. And he was a cartoonist, pretty well known. He was also quite a character. Um, and he did the Little Abner series. And so I'm sitting there at the Hotel Vernon. So in, there, they have a, a, there's a bar and also a performance space and things like that. Mm. But I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, Arkansas is here, right? And this is where I'm from. I'm from the state of Arkansas. Because when I was growing up, Lil Abner, that comic strip, was the only uh, way that I saw Arkansas, you know, <laughs> nationally. You know what I mean? Like, I got to see, like, where I was from. And, of course, it was being made fun of a little bit, right? But it didn't matter. I got to see sort of um, the state where I was from uh, in national newspapers and things like that. So I decided that I should get a job at the Hotel Vernon for the summer, and that's what I did. So these poems, um, mo many of them, not all of them, but many of them took, I, I wrote the drafts while I was working um, there at the bar. The other thing that you need to know is that upstairs, even though it's Hotel Vernon, and at one point had been a very fancy place for politicians to do their backdoor deals. And um, Babe Ruth, his rookie year, used to go there and drink in the speakeasy that was downstairs, which is still there. So if you ever go, hopefully it's still standing, but if you ever go, you can go downstairs and you can still see um, that speakeasy. Not much left, but you can still kind of get a sense of it. But upstairs now, um, and probably now for the last... 50 years has, has really turned into kind of a boarding house, kind of, you know, or what might be known as a flop house even. So, you know, kind of pay by the week kind of place. So a lot of the people that were my patrons um, uh, also lived upstairs. And so a lot of the book has to do with stories about them. And I think that's where I'll start uh, tonight, and I'll read um, a f about a few of these, these folks. Kelly Square Love Song. I write a poem about eating eggs with you. One month passes and you tell me you hate eggs, even scrambled. This woman half waltzes, half staggers into the Vernon. She loves the word gorgeous. She says, gorgeous blondes and we three are gorgeous. And this is a gorgeous day. She has lost a youngest son, a house, land in County Cork, they say. She wears a pinoir, black and pilled like a noble obligation. No panties. Pisses herself standing up. 
I forgive your dislike of eggs. Recall your fingers poised before sweet thing, before thunder road, before dream baby. Your perfect pitch, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. The next poem is called Sentences for the Baker. Um, and the baker was this really interesting uh, guy, really a small, a very small man who had all these rumors uh, circulating about him um, when, when I was there. But he used to come down um, and, you know, and talk to me because he was lonely and things and tell me, tell me things. But he was also just a... He was just a really interesting character. I never got tired of talking to him because I just thought there's some real there's some real stories here. I, I'm not sure what was exactly true about him, but nevertheless, anyway. So here's here's a poem, sentences for the baker. In jail, they say, he learned tactics of a tiny man, slept in his own shit, foiled the sodomizers. And years before, demoted from baker to mopper among rumors of incest, illiteracy, the 12-year-old chicken plucker of Water Street, known to feed the Vernon mice, those tiny sailors, saltines and nips at noon. Once on a Friday night, two spangled Holy Cross girls plunged their hands into that bearded nest, danced him beneath Joe Myron's muralled sailors and seas, the Mariner's albatross still in flight circa 1940. He said, something was sprouting in his neck. He said, I don't come down here for the beer, you know. He said, it's lonely all day alone up there. Um, maybe I should cheer us up a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to re I'll read this. Um, this is like a little letter. This section of poems is called Notes from the Hotel Vernon. And actually, so um, at first I thought, you know, when I first got there, and you know how bars work. I mean, this has been a long time ago at this point, but you know how bars work. And if you're a bartender, people write you know you know they say things and yeah so uh, when I first started um, thinking about what this book would be I thought it was going to be about the notes that people passed me right um, and then I decided that there was a lot more going on here but this is a little uh, kind of a little section of this longer poem called notes from the Hotel Vernon and this is really kind of a, a, a kind of letter poem I'm fascinated with with poems that work like letters in the epigraph, the little quotation that comes um, at the top of the poem is from the poet, one of my favorite poets, Richard Hugo. Um, History has the way of making the past palatable, the dead a dream. I'm writing this from the Hotel Vernon where Louis just slid me a note on a Kino card. Fats is saved, reads the scribbled news flash across ovals and numbers. The boys sit out back between dumpster and 290, grilling dogs, singing the night the lights went out in Georgia and gentle on my mind. They call Roy Orbison that kid, as in that kid can sure sing or that kid really had something. If the bed bugs weren't so frequent and the hound-eyed man down the hall didn't shit in the shower every Thursday, this could be home. Some nights, Al and I sit on the roof, watch the square blink on and off, memories in motion. Once in Paris, near the San Michel station, I was homeless after missing the last train to saint Cloud and losing my shoes. The French the hotelier spoke even poorer than mine, still managed to send me through accordion gates and up a hall which couldn't avoid the shining in my mind. Isolate parallelograms beckoning red with no red in sight. I was sleepless to a dubbed law and ordered order SVU, three showers, compelled to rise each hour on the hour, detecting a figure, 
across the courtyard at a window. How did she know to push the curtain back a bit, to shift in that way? Why was she searching this Parisian dark? How did I wake precisely to see her each time? 6 a.m. appeared. I saw myself, a mirrored window. Like Arbus twins, one-armed and lazy-eyed, that ambiguity of lips. Wherever you go, there you are. Last October, Al and I stayed in a motel in Sosua. It had wooden paneling and perched on a bladder-shaped pool, a collection of paperbacks from previous guests slumped on a single shelf. I stole Clarissa Pinkola Estes's Women Who Run With Wolves. The owner, a widower from Arizona, had a pacemaker you could see in his chest like a pack of cigarettes under skin. He choked up over his dead wife, who loved parakeets and collected rag dolls after he chewed us out for leaving the fan on. We'd gone to the Colmado to buy Cokes for rum. Al standing in the doorway, me on the edge of the bed, the old man shirtless with a belly in that pacemaker, the hum of an AC unit and the drum of a Dominican night. I'm not so sure that that was so cheery, but there you go. <laughs> um, I will actually read some. I'll read one more. Um, so I, I, do, I confess, I love collages. I have ever since I was a little kid. I loved taking materials from different places and, um, you know, patching them all together and see, you know, see what the odd juxtapositions would do. And so when I was at uh, that summer at the Vernon, I listened, I, and plus, here's another thing. I love jukeboxes. Like, I love them. Like, if I had, you know, any amount of money, I would buy a jukebox. Take a note of that, honey. Um, <laughs> so, so I listened to the jukebox a lot, and of course, um, you can imagine, kind of, you hear a lot of the same things. And so I was hearing a lot of, um, of uh, Debbie Harry. You all know Debbie Harry? A little bit? No, I know. See, this is the thing. This, this poem may have a, like an age limit here. So everyone, you know, old like me, anyway, will know Debbie Harry, but maybe for you young folks, you have to go kind of look her up. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was doing was I was reading, um, what was I reading at the time? I don't even know what I was reading at the time. Now I'm thinking like, well, um, Moby Dick. How could I forget that? Right. Anyway, and so I was thinking about that character Ishmael, and I'm listening to Debbie Harry, and I don't know, I just got this weird idea of like, what would it be like if Ishmael wrote to Debbie Harry? What would, right? I, isn't that a weird thought? It was weird, you know? And anyway, so I started looking, in, you know, I, I kept reading Moby Dick, but then I started looking up a bunch of stuff about Debbie Harry, and of course I have all these pop lyrics in my head just because that's the kind of person I am. And so you're going to hear like a mishmash of uh, Debbie Harry songs along with um, some stuff about Moby Dick, right? All right. Ishmael writes to Debbie Harry. Call me across ocean reveries. Call me from against the spiles. Call me at the spouter inn and to the wailing church on time. Call me with side-lunging strides. Call me your top 40 hit, hummed through scrimshaw comb, beat by pelican foot. Call me the 18th sexiest protagonist, your blubber boiler lover, poet of the horsehead doldrums. Call me any time sea pen, your fiddle hurt heart urchin. From CBGB's toilet and graffitied brick, call me Queequeg's bitch, je m'appelle Ishmael in the voice of Sid Vicious. Call me a Ted Bundy escape plan, an outlier's alibi, a Nantucket sleigh ride. Roll me an ambergris from narcotizing sight lines to Max's Kansas City. I'll never get enough. As Jericho was called to the Medusa, as Mocha stove the Essex, as dice of drowned men's bones, call me to the Go-Go, the Playboy Mansion, Rockaway Beach, or Rock and Roll High School before the trill of your high. Call me your number one jawbone prosthetic, your heart of glass, your new wave, your stub, or Starbuck, or Flask, your three-core Tashtigo. 
your dreaming Sunday cannibal, your 30,000 shark teeth, your humpback rhyme master, breathe like a pod of right whales in midnight into my ear. I could be your stabilitous loci, your garden of amorphous concealment, your finny tribe or spherical, your rapture. So one of the quirky little things that I found out was that um, that Debbie Harry had escaped from Ted, but like Ted Bundy tried to kidnap her. Have y'all? Maybe this is. I don't know if this might be urban legend. I don't know. But anyway, but um, yeah, that he tried to kidnap her, um, or like he got her into a car, and like she jumped out and ran away and whatever. Anyway, that that was one thing that I found out that I thought was kind of interesting. Anyway. Um, so the next um, bit, the, the next book, I, this chat books, I guess, or the next project that I'm reading from um, are called the OED Odes. And I got this idea um, really from um, a book called Magnolia, which is um, by the poet A. Van Jordan. And Magnolia is a book actually about... Um, a little African-American girl from Ohio who, um, this is historically true, who was this spelling bee champ. Um, and so she made it all the way to nationals. And then um, as the world turns these days, right, she lost barely because they introduced a word that had not been on the list, all right? So it's a wonderful book. I'm, I'm sort of plugging this book for you all as well. But um, A. Van Jordan does this stuff with, really cool with singular words. And so I got the idea from him, and I've kind of kept going with it. And so um, these poems sort of walk a kind of, they're dictionary-like in some ways, but walk a kind of perimeter, a lot of times having to do with my own memories or associations, or maybe the sounds of words, or maybe different parts of the definitions and that sort of thing. So this first piece that I read is from the chat book, Spell to Spell. Um, and I'm going to read the opening one here, um, which is one of the early ones called Escapeful, which is an adjective giving a chance of escape. I'll just tell you this. This is, I, I hated high school. I'm going to just be out there with it. I know some people love high school. Um, I used to go and sit on my roof, you'll hear this, um, and dream about leaving, right? And so part of this was that I had moved in high school and was living in Joplin, Missouri, uh, another place very hard to love, by the way, um, in the last couple of years, like from my junior and senior year. So I, I used to dream a lot about leaving. So this is kind of uh, that about that. Escapeful. Makes me think baleful, grateful, pitiful. That window in Joplin, Missouri at 17, a wishful transform, transom that led to the roof behind the honey locust where I went, dreamt away as if it were its own country, country of not here where I was then in that age of me, grazing desire to light out from that grade in mining town, the city that Jack built, Jack being zinc and sinkholes dotting 35.6 square miles from range line road to Souls Harbor to Crystal Caves, filled in for a parking lot where Bonnie and Clyde holed up in the 30s, played rummy, chain-smoked camels, robbed, killed, fled, left behind a film-filled camera the globe developed. Bonnie's Mary Jane poised on fender, Clyde holding her in a bride-over-threshold pose, or that shot with arm, akimbo, and pistol, hip-cocked and cigar at lip. While skirting the edges of Bienville Parish, their ambush, turned circus-like, the coroner said, throngs gathering to cut the bloody locks from Bonnie's head, Clyde's trigger finger and ear, gather shell casings and shattered glass from the Ford V8 sold as souvenirs. Something I thought about in passing that Sunday, we strolled through porridge after mussels and schnitzel past that fourth century church, its marble from the Sea of Marmara, an old Christian hideout, its bell tower a lookout into a western blue. 
There were candles to light, gelato to try, baseball jerseys for sale, hanging from rafters in the shops. Bonnie number one, Clyde number two. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. So, um, so that's really true that um, if you get online, it, you all know who Bonnie and Clyde are, the famous outlaws, okay. Um, by the way, Bonnie was also a poet. She, she wrote poetry in prison, just an FYI. Anyway, I'm not sure how good it is, but, um, but all of that, those famous photos that you see where they're pointing guns at each other and, you know, or, or Clyde's holding her in a kind of romantic pose and whatnot. Um, nevertheless, I think they still have guns. All of those were taken when they were hiding out in Joplin, Missouri. I didn't know that. But so they left behind this whole camera with, with, that got developed by the local newspaper there. Um, but then, so the end of that poem ends in Croatia, where I got to go, um, wow, in another world, <laughs> right? Another age, um, some years ago. And I was out walking around, and so there were these baseball jerseys with Bonnie and Clyde, I, I thought it was the most bizarro thing, but there you go. That's that's what travel um, used to be like. So I'll read one more out of this little chat book. Um, and maybe a couple more, and then we'll, we'll call it a night here. Um, this one is for my, te my own teacher, and this poem is called Dazzling. Um, and my teacher, Michael Ananiah, um, I studied in Chicago, and he used to introduce really good poems by saying, that's dazzling. And he would just, he loved that word. And he also, he had, he has a gap between his teeth. He's still alive in, in writing and all that um, these days, but nevertheless. And just the way he said it just made you love poetry that much more, or you get excited, right, about what you're about to hear. Isn't this dazzling, he would say. Anyway. Um, but yeah, this is about being a student in Chicago and, and, also, uh, and also just about Chicago as well. Dazzling. That was Chicago then. We sat around a table like other grad students all over the country discussing languages coagulation into the graduating gloam. Ashbury's convex mirror, McGrath's letter to an imaginary friend. Levertov's evening train. Pigeons cooed and shat those brutalist ledges, the bulletproof windows. Stairwells stunk of not-so-secret smokers. The Eisenhower rushed the roar to screech of the blue line, Greek town's opa and flames just north. Goat carcasses and wood smoke and vacancies pocked the south. Speak softly, love floating from an open door just off Taylor Street. Dazzling. It was how he said it. Daz stretched the mouth wide as a marquee showcased that gap between his front teeth, a sign of randiness if Chaucer is believed. Alluring. In Theos for the poem, made you think back to those years the stroll hopped when Satchmo joined King Oliver, arrived Central Station in his hick pants and white socks, a real rube all the way from New Orleans come to play. Or Dorothy, in her pinafore before Emerald Oz, bombs vision of shy. Forget, forget the burned inner thigh, the asbestos snow job, a sweet blinding, stealing us, a scintilla, a sound. Um, just a, a word about um, Chicago. I don't know if you all know the Wizard of Oz books and all that. Yeah, so I didn't know this until I, I think probably when I started writing this poem that um, Emerald, the Emerald City was, uh, was his um, vision of Chicago, right? And so you can now, I mean, that just means it's so much more interesting for me now to watch The Wizard of Oz or to go back to those books and that sort of thing. But also this is a, a little bit about um, uh, Louis Armstrong coming to Chicago and it really changes the whole jazz world as well. So um, I'm gonna move on to the last couple of poems that I'll read. And this is out of this pretty cool book, I would say, uh, Murmurations. 
and it was uh, handmade. The paper is hand uh, handmade um, by the artist Erica Spitzer Rasmussen, who's also um, fortunately my sister-in-law. And so we worked on this project uh, together. So it's a really nice book to get to to read from and hold in your hands as well. Um, so I'm going to read a poem for my students, um, which is a poem that's dedicated uh, to another one of their professors and, and my dear colleague, um, Maura Fitzgibbons. And this, I, I don't know about you all, but I love archaic words. I love old words that nobody uses anymore. I don't know. It's just like this thing for me. I, I mean, it's like watching old movies, perhaps. I'm not sure, but I, it's just a thing that I really um, love to find words that I didn't know before. And so this word, cistern, um, is the plural of sisters. Um, and so it's an archaic word. Now think about this for a second. So brethren, not that it's a word that you use a lot, but you still know it, right? We still know brethren, right? It's mostly used in church and religious things, but cistern has gone away. All right, sister. So I, I was really kind of thinking about that. And when I did the investigation in the Oxford English Dictionary, um, I found out that sister also was used And this. Maybe this won't surprise you all. I don't know. It kind of surprised me. It was either used for uh, nuns in nunneries or it was used for prostitutes in brothels. So think about these two kind of polarized uh, groups of women, but also if you think about it, they're both groups of women that are sort of living outside of like a mainstream thing, right? Sisterin, right? This group of women, group of sisters. Okay, sisterin for Maura Fitzgibbons. A nunnery or brothel of mercy, of charity, of the scabbard or bank, multiple suster, the graces and fates a support step, palms parallel to the lifeline, a sister child also known as a nephew, a niece. It's twisted, sister, how in the name of order, group erases group, dismissed beyond the single hemmed in, shamed by. We try to suss out isolation, discover what keeps baby in the corner, in the tower, in that hut, in a forest, craving and luring alone, dreaming through Hollywood on a porch swing by the man in the moon. We are the light of the hairbreadth and stones throw the bushel basket in deep hollow in a word power sundered, which is to say modest. My dears and women, gals and ladies of the shared night sweats and minces, birthing controls and canals, thoughts bodied so as not to forget what comes with this wisdom, a vision, visage of Udo von Ballenstedt, bloodied heel and toe, too ugly, too beautiful, too simple, too wise, too old, division of us sisters. Um, well, one thing I want to just tell you, and I should have told you before, Uta von Balancet, this is a really cool um, little piece of information that I learned, um, was this 11th century noble woman, and her face was used both as, I want mean, to look at my notes, she was both used as the model for the Wicked Queen in Disney's Snow White, you all know that face, but she was also used as a model um, for Aryan womanhood, like in, a, like in a good way, right? For the Nazi anti-Semitic uh, documentary, The Eternal Jew. So this is going to change the next time that you see that old Snow White movie. You can go, Uta von Ballenstedt, right? And um, anyway, so she, so she did double duty for both Disney and the Nazis. Anyway, there you go. Uh, she got around there, I guess. Um, Okay, I, I think the last one I'm going to read, just because it's a, a little bit long, but and it has a little story, or actually a few stories to it, is a poem um, that I wrote after uh, being, being in uh, Buenos Aires. Actually, I think it was after we got robbed that I, I realized what a good poem it was, and then I had to go and rewrite it from scratch from my memory right so I kind of sketched it out before and then we were mugged and so 
Um, so anyway, so it really stayed in my head a lot, right? Um, but so I'll just tell you this. So in the 1970s and 80s, I don't know, maybe you all know this, maybe you don't, um, Argentina's Dirty War, right, uh, took place in which a lot of people were disappeared, a lot of students and uh, union um, folks and teachers and that sort of thing. Um, and they were often taken to this um, school, naval school uh, that was turned into a detention center. And so I thought it would be a good idea to go and visit this thing, this place in which I had done a lot of reading about, you know, in a lot of research in my 20s and, and because I was really interested in Latin American politics and whatnot. Um, and then I sort of forgot that my husband's family had had to leave Austria because of the Nazis. So, and actually his father, as a very young boy, had watched uh, them march in, right? And so I realized what a monster that I was in making my dear spouse come with me to essentially, you know, um, a death camp, you know, that's what it, what it was. So anyway, so that's kind of, uh, the, you know, the story behind this, this last poem that I'll read which is also a lot about language as well. So this, the title of this is Delitas, and it's the Spanish word that means crimes. It's in three parts. One, hard to resist the word's resemblance to delights, but knowing it can't be. I look it up after reading it over and over on plaques stationed here and there in this naval base turned detention center bare except for the faces stenciled across walls, blurbs about terror, death flights, bodies washing up in the Rio de la Plata. In the one building we enter, portraits of the Plaza del Mayo mothers order the hallway, birth dates embroidered into their white scarves. They present children's photos in a mute show and tell. We emerge to skies canopy, a hint of rain, gaze up at monk parakeets and hoop pines, their nests, cylindrical baskets like something we might buy in a tourist market. You tell me you didn't know I was taking you here after the art museum, didn't know after lunch of pulpo and salad. I say, I told you, you don't listen. And we almost fight, but then go outside the gates to sit on a curb and cry. Two, your father, grandparents, your uncle Paul, a baby forever at that window in Vienna, watching them parade into 1938, what was called Anschluss, adjoining, or Blumenkrieg, the War of the Flowers. Later in Seattle, your grandmother, naming her parakeet Franz Joseph, because she said he was always so good to us. Three, headed for San Telmo, searching out tango, our cab driver drums the wheel and sings to 80s hits. Ring my bell and how will I know, super freak in where the streets have no name. We pass statue after statue of men on horses, men dressed for war. Figures look one way, words another. You practice reading in Spanish, joke about names of restaurants, Kentucky pizza and Louisiana fried chicken, next to the center for the deported. What irony, you tell me. I say no. El Centro del Deportivos is just a sports arena. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. And thank you, a special thank you to the students that came out um, to help celebrate National Poetry Month. And we are going to have an open mic tonight. Um, so I ask that, um, can I just see hands of maybe some people who have poems to read with us this evening? OK, three. So Rick, Gordon, and I'm sorry, what's your name, sir? Stuart. Stuart? 
Okay, so I ask that you limit it to about three, and um, that's the order. Rick, Gordon, and Stuart, okay? So come on up. Come on up, Rick. Okay. <clears throat> My name's Rick Ostreich. Uh, in German, it would be Erstreich. Um, and I have a science background. I mainly write nonfiction science for kids, but I also dabble with poetry. Some of the poems are silly little things. Some are more serious. Start with the silly. This is called Pomelo et Alia. A pomelo is quite yellow, a fruit that's none too sweet. It's a tart but tasty fellow and it's always fun to eat. A shaddock is no haddock, a fruit and not a fish. You can plant them with a mattock and then serve one on a dish. <laughs> Grand and noble pomplemousse is a fruit of great renown. Eat one that is rolling loose or when hanging upside down. A grapefruit by a different name is tart and not so mellow. This tasty fruit of widespread fame called shaddock, pomplemousse, or pomelo. Okay, a little more serious. This is called not done yet. What would a Neanderthal think if he saw the Taj Mahal heard Beethoven's ninth, flew in a jet plane. Surely he would believe these were the creations of gods. No, not gods, homo sapiens, and were not done yet. And since Earth Day is coming up in a few days, let me go through this one. This is called Dead End. Me, 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 me. The world exists only for me. Destroy the earth, why should I care? The world is mine, that just seems fair. Take, 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 take. Why should I give when I can take? Respect the future, surely you jest. Stop complaining, you're being a pest. More, 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 more. I still deserve very much more. Now I'm dying, how can this be? Will the world cease when there's no me? Dead, 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 dead. Much more of this and the earth will be dead. Thank you, Rick. Thank you so much. And um, next up is Gordon, and he is our feature for um, next month in May. So come on down. The price is right. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thank you for reading in for the students. And I'm, I still, I'm not going to get uh, Debbie Harry or Shmuel out of my head, but uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and to the students, um, over time, I'd grab my, my yogi teas and just have little uh, uh, dish towels, scraps of paper. But thank you so much for it was very personable in what you shared. So uh, that being said, this one is called um, Write Anything, Yeah, Shake Off the Cobweb. Shake off the cobwebs. And I know how Samwise felt with Frodo being that he wasn't, he wasn't there when the cords were cut, desperate in hearing that he was paralyzed, not done in. I heard of and told a friend of the mythology of a Native American tribe that life traveled bound on a spider's web. The moral of the tale was to tread and step lightly with caution for how you touched could send discord or harmony rippling along to disturb or appease others who share that web with you. So write, shake off the cobwebs, and let not Shelob haunt your dreams, Tolkien fans. 
just write and write and acknowledge that I have been here before in some time, place, and circumstance. Part of the story that continues on. Just my portion now to collaborate and hopeful not to be like the old man in the sea and realize that I went out too far. Box in my head. The box in my head I have wondered about, like changing the diaper of my mind. Some of those things really stinked and P.U. The change was necessary. The memory box had some damage and other time was able to pull out the toys in the attic that were good. My rosebud, if you will. Now try not to take offense if I elude you who read or hear this spoken. I'm only as sick as my secrets and have the chance, the opportunity, not to close the lid as Suriman of the many colors did and fall from wisdom to rewrite the page already written. What can I write about? What I find in the time I found a tool called discernment. The archeological dig was vast and had good help and good association to find it. That is when I remembered to use it. I was a Toys R Us kid. Neverland was the goal, but Peter's hat and shoe were lost. The mothballs couldn't save. Who am I? What am I doing? Where do I need to go? I couldn't tell. Don Quixote's relics disappeared. Blame that on puberty. With great power comes great responsibility. Asgard, Gotham. There and back again, dear Bilbo. I go in fear and doubt. One thing for certain, I have pained and vowed to be the best of, to my ability to serve and never to open Pandora's box. For curiosity has not killed this cat. So far, so good. Now something for the absurd, maybe something a little comical, but we'll, who knows. Recipe for the impossible. Hulk smash! Hulk the strongest one there is! That is, of course, first, find a military test site in the desert near Area 51. Second, spot a foolish teenager wheeling in a dune buggy. Third, as a scientist, carjack a jeep and drive out to intercept him. Fourth, find the only trench and throw Rick the teenager first, then leap and absorb in a flash the full dosage of gamma radiation. Yeah, pretty sure the dentist having me wear that lead smock was done for the most practical reasons. Ah, let's see, next, focus on self-doubt. Be more introverted and shy. Be a admirer from afar, which by today's standards, a stalker. <laughs> and register for the science ex exhibition at Osborne Laboratories. Check the itinerary. Make sure there is an experiment with arachnids and radioactive currents. Walk closer to Gwen and be directly under the descending web of spider and have it land and encourage it to bite you on the hand. Changing your DNA to adapt proportionate speed and strength of a spider and spider sense. Then, to have enough sense to know that H.G. Wells wrote a story of a time traveler. At least he learned you can only go forth with what you have learned and not to try to relive and re-edit memories past. For they are the foundation, the grounding to build a future upon. Quill and candle, quill and candle. Where, oh where, can I forge my wax wings of wax? Now that's a recipe for the impossible. For the sun's warmth melts when exposed too long. Thank you for the blondie reference. <laughs> My name is Stuart. This is Remember. I remember her eyes sparkling at life, the future, the past, her joy shun her laugh. 
was so light. What does it mean to know who we are? How does it feel to say, I am peace? Her eyes echoed my answers. We are souls, we are peace. This is uh, called Growing Up Drunkenness. Can you repeat that? Growing Up Drunkenness. To drinking, growing up drunkenness was not regarded as a social disgrace. To get enough to eat was regarded as an achievement. To get drunk was a victory. Faith of living, still in spite of faith, we live before friend and foe. In all our strife, we are chained in prison, dark, we're still in heat and conscious free. Faith our fathers, we still strive to win. Now the day is over, night is drawing. When the morning wakens, then may I arise. The long night watches, may the angels spread. There are days so dark that I see in vain the face of light. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for a great, great night of poetry. And I uh, hope to see you next month, third Thursday of the month. The date off the top of my head? May 20th. May 20th. Thank wow. you. Thank you very much. May 20th, Gordon Briggs, and then uh, an open mic to follow. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And um, have a great night. <laughs>